by 08, the end of 08, early 09, it was terror like I've never seen. You could not reason with people. They were losing so much money so fast. I remember one client saying, if I keep losing at this rate, this was like January of 09, I'll be out of money by the end of the year, exactly. And it was, I mean, people that normally would be buyers in a weak market, they were like, I, I, I want to, I just want to stop the bleeding. This is about survival. Seeking to understand what's happening beneath the market surface is the very essence of active management. It's what separates the professional manager from the retail investor, and it's the answer to the question, why do I pay fees when I can invest in passive instruments and save myself a few basis points? Never is that more vital than at key market inflection points, which of course is precisely when the maximum number of retail investors need experienced counsel more than ever, but when they are least receptive to the message. I want to take you back to 08. And let's talk about that relationship and those conversations you had. I mean, for you, I know from 2006 onwards, I know, you, I know the conversations you were having from your side. I'm interested to hear how those words of caution were received and then coming into 08, how the dynamic between you and customers changed. So let's say summer of 07, I actually wrote a newsletter saying I thought there would be a recession in 08. A lot of, a lot of pushback, a lot of like, oh, you're way too alarmist. And our, you know, thing was derivatives and leverage and housing that it just looked very precarious. And as it turned out, we were not negative enough. Right. Uh, but again, people were not really receptive to hearing even our message back in 07. By 08, the end of 08, early 09, it was terror like I've never seen. You could not reason with people. They were losing so much money so fast. I remember one client saying, if I keep losing at this rate, this was like January of 09, I'll be out of money by the end of the year, exactly. And it was, I mean, people that normally would be buyers in a weak market, they were like, I, 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 wanna, I just wanna stop the bleeding. This is about survival. The only way, frankly, we dealt with it is because the yield securities, you know, preferred stocks, uh, midstream pipelines, corporate bonds, high yield, high yield bonds were yielding like 23%. Mm -hmm. They were way cheaper than the stock market was. The stock market was kind of a, I mean, it was undervalued, but not, as you've seen, it wasn't 1982 undervalued, 1974 undervalued, not even close. But the, the yield markets, the corporate yield markets were 1932. Right. So what saved us was for the people that would listen to it, and the most of them would, would say, well, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna sell your stocks at a terribly low time. You're gonna go to cash, which pays nothing. How about, I mean, do you really think Comcast is going out of business? No, I don't think Comcast. Why don't we buy the Comcast preferred that's down 40% yielding 13%? You can get 13% and as long as they stay in bit. So that was the, the conversation that we had. And it was like, and if those companies fail, it's not gonna matter where your money is. Right, but, but, you, but again, this comes back to your first point about, about communication and having those conversations with people you know, at, at a time where it's tough to get them to stop for a second and, and listen to a lengthy explanation. They just want out. It's like, right, sell everything and then we'll have the conversation. Right. So you know, how do you go about kind of sh shaking them by the shoulder and saying, look, just listen to me for a second? Well, there are people that won't. I mean, I've seen that so many times. You know, the look in the eyes, it's just like sheer terror. And when people are in a sheer terror mode, you really have no hope. Yeah. Most people don't get quite that bad. Most people are actually looking for guidance at a time like that. So if you can pre present a credible case, and say, this is a way that you can reduce your risk because you're going from stocks to something less risky, but still have huge returns, huge cash flow, and great recovery potential. Uh, you know, there were bonds, that, like Nordstrom, Nordstrom's bonds, our local retailer, that over a year or less went up 75% in value. You know, that, and, and we did. We said, those bonds will go back to par. And so, if you, I mean, it helps to have something like that, something that's really tangible. Yeah. I mean, I think that our business is very intangible. If you can give people something, especially during times of adversity, that they can really relate to, that helps a lot. Well, let, let's, let's talk, because this is, this is a perfect time to do this, because those conversations you, you have to have in the heat of the white hot furnace, right, when things are falling apart. You know, here we are now with seemingly everything is Jake, right? everything is great. The, to your point, profit margins are great. We're up, yes, we're at extended valuations. But, but talk a little bit 
for the people watching this who, who are investors with money managers, what conversations should they be having now? How should they be looking at this and how should they be thinking or at least beginning to, to, to make preparations for something we know is inevitable at some point. The degree of it is, is, is debatable and the timing is completely unknown. But how, if you could talk to customers now in, in the calm, what advice would you give them about how to prepare yourself mentally? Well, I would say look at your age because people forget that they're, you know, usually when they set their investment objectives, it was 10, 15 years yeah. ago and they don't change. And then as prices go up, they don't typically rebalance. So they really should have a lot less equities than they do, excuse me, currently, but that's something that just doesn't get reviewed like it should. And it's always tough when the market's rolling to get people to say, you need to take money off the table. I'll give you a tangible example. I have a good friend, she's getting divorced. Uh, she's gonna get a, a sum of money that's basically all the money she's ever gonna have. And she said, well, I'm gonna meet with my advisors and what should I you know, ask myself? Well, find out first of all, what's your equity allocation? Well, it turns out it's basically 90%. Right. And, and she's in her 60s. Right. And I said, well, that's way too much. She goes, yes, you know, they, they've admitted that, but it's a very major tax hit to get me down. I said, where, she said, where should I be? And I said, probably around 30%. Yeah. Uh, you know, given current market conditions, maybe 40 normally. But, you know, the, th the tax hit, so this is where it also gets to be kind of insidious. You know, in other countries, you don't have to deal with that. Yeah. But in this country, it's very expensive to take capital gains. So people kind of get locked into it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very, it's just the opposite of when people are fearful, that's tough. When people are greedy, that's tough. And lately there's been a lot more greed than fear.